Here lies Eric Arthur Blair, a man who had such a deep impact on 20th century political writing that his surname has become a metonym for dystopia. And no, I'm not talking about Blairism. If you're wondering why I've driven 30 minutes to visit the grave of a man who you perhaps have never even heard of, you may be more familiar with the pen name that he wrote under, George Orwell. And perhaps a graveyard is a fitting place to open today's video, in which I want to talk about Orwell's views on a tragedy that he perceived as far back as 1946, the death of the English language. Orwell was first and foremost a political writer with a particular care for clarity of language, which he felt was a necessary precondition for clarity of thought. So much of political disaster, as he saw it, can be attributed to the lack of this crucial component in our thinking and our speaking and our writing. Orwell's most celebrated work, of course, 1984, is in many ways a book about language and how its erosion has a corrupting influence not only on the way that we communicate, but also on the way that we think, and especially the way that we think about politics. Now, say what you will about the state of modern political discourse, you'll have a hard time arguing that it's characterized by clarity or lack of ambiguity, and this is what Orwell was so terrified of. It's something of a trope to recognize that the English language is in decline and to complain about the fact that the newer generations are corrupting it so carelessly. But the good news is, that Orwell thought that there was something we can do about this, and in fact gave us some very specific tips on how we can avoid this erosion of our thinking and of our writing, and how we can aim to be much more clear in the discussion of political topics. Today, of course, Orwell is mostly remembered for his works of fiction, but he also has an expansive corpus of essays. One in particular, called Politics and the English Language, written in 1946, is one of the most insightful commentaries on this subject of language available in print, even to this day. And so today we're going to explore that essay and the tips that he gives for writing more clearly and discover why it is that Orwell is still remembered, even now, as one of the clearest and most intelligent writers of the 20th century. Orwell begins his essay by providing some examples of bad modern English. In order to fix our writing, of course, we need an idea of what it is that's going wrong. Here's one example that he cites, written by Harold Lasky. I am not, indeed, sure whether it is not true to say that Milton, who once seemed not unlike a 17th century Shelley, had not become, out of an experience ever more bitter in each year, more alien to the founder of that Jesuit sect, which nothing could induce him to tolerate. Got that? Of course not. What on earth did that sentence mean? This kind of lack of clarity is something that Orwell thought was found all over political discourse, and he thought that it always shared two problems in particular. The first, he writes, is staleness of imagery. The other is lack of precision. Let's talk first about staleness of imagery. One of the most helpful ways to convey a message is to use metaphor and simile, creating unique mental images to illustrate a point. Orwell quotes Ecclesiastes as an example of brilliant use of imagery. I returned and saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, neither yet bread to the wise, nor yet riches to men of understanding, nor yet favour to men of skill, but time and chance happeneth to them all. A beautiful way, I think you'll agree, to express the idea that luck, rather than skill, is often the reason why people are successful. And to show what so often goes wrong in modern writing, Orwell translates this passage into what he calls modern English of the worst sort. Objective considerations of contemporary phenomena compel the conclusion that success or failure in competitive activities exhibits no tendency to be commensurate with innate capacity, but that a considerable element of the unpredictable must invariably be taken into account. This says the same thing as the original biblical passage, but it's far more stale, far less eloquent, and indeed far less convincing than the original. Why? because it's a circus of unnecessarily complex words which are completely devoid of imagery in an attempt to feign sophistication. Though the same point is made, the lack of imagery, of bread to the wise and riches to men of understanding, is lost. And it's exactly this kind of imagery that makes Ecclesiastes such an eloquent book. Orwell's second complaint, you'll remember, is lack of precision. 
This is something we can find all over modern writing and speaking. In politics, consider how instead of saying, I made a mistake, politicians will often say something more like, undeniably departmental mistakes were made in the process of decision making which will be addressed as a matter of urgency. Or perhaps you've felt that nagging feeling that regardless of how many times an interviewer asks a question, a politician just seems ludicrously incapable of giving what we might call a straight answer. Did you threaten to overrule I, I was not entitled to instruct Derek Lewis, and I did not instruct him. And did the you truth threaten of, to overrule the, the truth of the matter is that Mr Marriott was not suspended. Did you I threaten did not, to overrule him? I did not overrule Derek did Lewis. Did you threaten to overrule him? I took advice on what I could or could not did do. Did you threaten to I overrule him, Mr Howard? I acted scrupulously in accordance with that advice. I did not overrule Derek Lewis. Did you Lewis. threaten to overrule him? Mr Marriott him? was not suspended. Did you uh, threaten to overrule him? I have a I'm sorry, I'm going to be is frightfully this? rude, but... Yes, you but can... I, I'm sorry. The defining quality of such speech is, as Orwell says, lack of precision. I would add that this kind of writing and speaking also extends to academia, especially, I hate to have to say it, in the humanities. The social sciences in particular are often accused of containing large swaths of essentially meaningless words strung mindlessly together. Here's a sometimes cited example of a single sentence from an essay by the philosopher Judith Butler. The move from a structuralist account in which capital is understood to structure social relations in relatively homologous ways to a view of hegemony in which power relations are subject to repetition, convergence, and rearticulation brought the question of temporality into the thinking of structure and marked a shift from a form of Althusserian theory that take structural tonalities as theoretical objects to one in which the insights into the contingent possibility of structure inaugurate a renewed conception of hegemony as bound up with the contingent sites and strategies of the rearticulation of power. How very insightful. This meaningless verbiage by a professor at Berkeley was actually published in a real scholarly journal and, I think, is exactly the kind of writing that would have made George Orwell start to uncontrollably vomit. Luckily, though, Orwell has helpfully specified four things to avoid in your own writing and speaking in order to prevent the kind of unclarity that we've seen in these examples. Four things to resist in particular, and here they are. First, dying metaphors. Genuinely fresh metaphors are a crucial tool, evoking a visual image to help make a point. Orwell compares these with dead metaphors, those which have been so overused that they actually cease to be metaphors altogether, and instead begin to function like ordinary words. Consider referring to something as brand new. What does this mean, brand new? Originally, this referred to a brand or fire brand, implying the immediate newness of something just forged in a fire. Saying brand new thus evoked an image, one that simply isn't evoked anymore. Now it's just a plain phrase, functioning like any other ordinary word. To be clear, dead metaphors, like brand new, are fine to use, specifically because they are dead. They now function like ordinary words. What we should avoid, according to Orwell, is not dead metaphors, but dying metaphors. Somewhere between alive and dead, no longer fresh enough to be insightful, but not quite dead enough to function as a common word. These are metaphors that someone, somewhere, cleverly devised a long time ago, but have now passed into common parlance, meaning that they no longer strike the reader or listener as interesting. Orwell's own examples of dying metaphors are, of course, a bit dated, being from the 40s, but one of the examples he gave was the phrase, stand shoulder to shoulder with. Such a metaphor is unoriginal and overused, and is perhaps best described as a cliché. It's boring. Your eyes or ears gloss over it without it having the evocative effect that was originally intended. When a country's leader boldly states that we will stand shoulder to shoulder with our allies, the sentence isn't nearly as powerful as it would have been when such a metaphor was genuinely original. Now it's just quite boring and common to hear. Another example Orwell gives is toe the line. When you hear this phrase, do you imagine people standing alongside each other at the beginning of a foot race? Probably not. Orwell notes that in this case, the original imagery has become so lost that this phrase is often even distorted into toe the line 
with a W. The imagery is stale, the meaning forgotten, and the metaphor is dying. I think that some modern examples of dying metaphors might include a rule of thumb, or skating on thin ice. Dying metaphors are, says Orwell, merely used because they save people the trouble of inventing phrases for themselves. The effect is that modern writing, quote, does not consist in picking out words for the sake of their meaning and inventing images in order to make the meaning clearer. It consists in gumming together long strips of words which have already been set in order by someone else and making the results presentable by sheer humbug. So, stop using dying metaphors that someone else came up with and everyone else uses. Try some new ones, all of your own. This will make your writing far more interesting. Second is what Orwell calls operators or verbal false limbs. He phrases this a bit weirdly, but this one is essentially an issue of economy. Instead of using the perfectly good word break, a person may write render inoperative. Instead of saying fight, they might say militate against. Orwell describes this kind of language as turning a verb into a whole phrase when it's unnecessary to do so. Other examples he gives include be subjected to, play a leading part in, and exhibit a tendency to. Such phrases may sound sophisticated, but when going for clarity, Orwell thinks that we should always use one word instead of many whenever we can. Now, I myself, for what it's worth, am not sure that I agree with Orwell here. I think this kind of writing is okay, so long as clarity is not hindered by a little bit of verbal dressing. Orwell also notes in this section something which today we can recognise as an obsession of politicians, which is speaking in the passive rather than the active voice. This is the difference between saying, I made a mistake, which is active, and mistakes were made, which is passive. A subtle distinction, but when the passive voice is overused, it renders a speech completely detached and impersonal. And so Orwell thinks that wherever possible, we should be using the active voice rather than the passive. Thirdly, in this section, Orwell advises against the not un formation, saying something like, not uncommonly, instead of the far easier, commonly. When criticised, a politician won't say the claims are founded, but rather the claims are not unfounded. This allows the speaker or writer to disguise uncomfortable admissions in ambiguous phrasing, and something that, for the sake of clarity, we ought to avoid. So, always prioritise clarity, and don't use more words when less will do. This is Orwell's second piece of advice to you. Third, pretentious diction. Of course, this will depend on the context, but frankly, try not to be pretentious. And before you run to the comments to call me a pretentious hypocrite, bear in mind that Orwell is talking here about literally putting up a pretense, using words inappropriately or falsely. For example, Orwell resents how words like objective or categorical are, quote, used to dress up a simple statement and give an air of scientific impartiality to biased judgments. Consider, for example, when someone claims that we need to follow the science, when in a lot of arguments, a person is really advocating for a biased personal judgment, an interpretation of data, not some objective scientific fact. Yet they will still label their views as objective, in an attempt to sound impartial. Orwell continues by noting that when writing about international politics, we say things like epoch-making, historic, inevitable and unprecedented, when oftentimes the subject matter is, in fact, not any of these things. And when talking about war, and keep in mind that this essay was published just after World War II, writing takes on an archaic colour, according to Orwell, using words like realm, and trident, sword and shield, and jackboot. In an even more egregious pretense, we might refer to a war as an intervention, or an invasion as an operation. Orwell also uses this section to advise against unnecessarily using foreign words where English ones will do. I should add, this obviously only applies when you're actually writing in English. Orwell cites phrases like cul-de-sac and status quo as being pretentious, but again, these are dated examples, since nowadays these are actually extremely common staples of very much non-pretentious English discourse. Orwell isn't against the use of foreign words. Of course, our entire language has roots all over the globe. 
But if a foreign word is being used just for the sake of sounding fancy or scientific, when there's actually a perfectly good commonly used alternative in the English language, that's just a bit annoying, I think you'll agree. But I do have a feeling that Orwell would agree with my stipulation here, which is that in many cases, in my view, there are foreign words whose specific meaning has no direct translation and is therefore best left untouched. But again, Orwell's key advice here is to avoid vagueness. Fourth, meaningless words. Okay, this seems a bit obvious. Of course, we don't want to use meaningless words, but Orwell is specifically advising against using words that don't have a specific definition. Using words that can mean something completely different to different listeners without actually specifying what you intend it to mean. Here's a quote from his essay. The word fascism has now no meaning except insofar as it signifies something not desirable. The words democracy, socialism, freedom, patriotic, realistic, justice, have each of them several different meanings which cannot be reconciled with one another. In the case of a word like democracy, not only is there no agreed definition, but the attempt to make one is resisted from all sides. It's almost universally felt that when we call a country democratic, we are praising it. Consequently, the defenders of every kind of regime claim that it is a democracy and fear that they might have to stop using that word if it were tied down to any one meaning. How very relatable. Now, Orwell also notes that many people use such words in a deliberately dishonest way, relying on the ambiguity in their definition to make claims which they can defend as honest because they did mean what they said, but that they know are misleading. Imagine a priest saying, the Catholic Church is opposed to persecution. Okay, sure, but we clearly just have different definitions of what counts as persecution. Another of Orwell's examples, the Soviet press is the freest in the world. Okay, fine, but I have a feeling that you've got a slightly more paternalistic conception of what freedom means than I do. The same thing, of course, happens in politics all the time, when a politician says, I would never do anything to harm the country. They kind of beg the question as to what harming the country means in the first place. Of course, what they're doing is something that they don't think is going to harm the country, but the whole argument is whether the thing they're doing is harmful at all. So the definition of harmful is something that needs to be specified in order for the sentence to even make sense. If these words are not strictly defined, then they are, in a sense, meaningless. They have no unifying meaning. This is exactly how we end up with the United States, the Netherlands, and North Korea all claiming to be democratic. Similarly, if a traditionalist community is accused of misogyny, they might say, no, no, we care deeply for the welfare of our women. I don't doubt that they genuinely do, but they probably have a different idea of what a woman's welfare consists in. Unless we specify precisely what it is that we're actually talking about, we will always run into avoidable ambiguities. So then, the way to avoid meaningless words is to precisely define what it is that you're talking about wherever you suspect that there might be some potential ambiguity. These, then, are Orwell's four things to avoid. Dying metaphors, false verbal limbs, pretentious diction, and meaningless words. Helpfully, Orwell condenses his points into six easy-to-follow rules whenever you're writing an essay or speech. One, never use a metaphor, simile, or other figure of speech which you are used to seeing in print. Two, Never use a long word where a short one will do. Three, if it is possible to cut out a word, always cut it out. Four, never use the passive where you can use the active. Five, never use a foreign phrase, a scientific word, or a jargon word if you can think of an everyday English equivalent. And six, perhaps most importantly, break any of these rules sooner than say anything outright barbarous. I've already mentioned that I personally distrust some of the advice that Orwell gives in this essay, but that final rule of his seems to recognize that there is some scope for legitimate disagreement about the points that he raises. I would highly recommend reading it for yourself. I'll leave a link in the description. But just bear in mind, if you do read it, that it was written in the 40s, and so the examples may seem a bit nonsensical to the modern reader, but you can easily fill in examples of your own. Reading politics and the English language, I get the impression that I, myself, have a bit more admiration for, shall we say, 
flair and linguistic indulgence than Orwell did. But then I'm not really a political writer, as Orwell was, and whenever I'm aiming at perfect clarity, I'm much more likely to follow his rules. At any rate, we can be sure that the people I quoted at the beginning of this video could certainly have done with listening to Mr. Eric Blair. By heeding his warnings, we might be able to protect our language against a decline in clarity and meaning, something he warned us about most extremely with 1984. And given that Orwell's writing is still today a staple of our culture, he must have been getting something right. Now there is something else that Orwell himself never wrote about protecting, because he died before it existed, but I like to think that if he were still alive, he'd care about it too. And that something is your internet security. That's right, I want to take a moment to thank ExpressVPN for sponsoring today's video. ExpressVPN is a virtual private network which protects your internet security when browsing online. The online world can be a nefarious place, with hackers trying to steal your data, and big tech companies mining your data to sell to advertisers. In fact, in the UK, internet service providers are required by law to keep logs of the websites that I visit, something that I actually never knew they were doing before I learned about internet security. Luckily, ExpressVPN is an incredibly simple app that you can use on your computer or smartphone, which allows you to choose from one of a whole host of servers from all over the world and connect to one of them instantly. ExpressVPN then reroutes all of my network data through this separate secure server, which hides my IP address and my location from any prying eyes. ExpressVPN also doesn't slow down my browsing at all. It's incredibly fast. You won't even notice that you have it on, but it will be on in the background, protecting your data. Hiding your location also means that you can appear as though you're anywhere in the world, allowing you to access content that's usually restricted by region. This is how I can, for instance, watch US Netflix, even when I'm in the UK. And here's the best part. You can get three months of all of this completely for free by using my referral link. Go to expressvpn.com forward slash cosmic skeptic, or click the link in the first line of the description and give yourself that extra bit of peace of mind. With that said, I want to say thank you for watching, and if you do like my content, please do consider becoming a supporter on Patreon, and a special thanks as always to my top tier patrons for helping to keep this channel financially afloat. More information is at patreon.com forward slash cosmic skeptic. Don't forget to subscribe and follow me on the various social media platforms, and I'll see you in the next one.